Hi, I'm Pastor Dan. I'm the lead pastor here at Holy Cross, and I'm so glad that you joined us for worship. We're in the middle of a series called Foolish Love, and you might hear that title and think that's kind of a weird title. But honestly, it's perfect this year for, for Lent. Lent begins with Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day, and it ends actually with Easter the day before, um, well, <laughs> April Fool's Day. And, and so that's what we're talking about, the fact that our God gives us over the top, lavish, in the eyes of the world, a foolish love to you and to me. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, uh, we, we see that <laughs> that Paul writes that the message of the cross is foolishness for those who don't believe. They think it's ridiculous. But for us who believe, it's everything. It has the power to save us and to change us. Well, again, thank you for joining us. And, you know, we'd love if you'd reach out to us and, and let us know how we can be praying for you, how we can come alongside of you, how we can encourage you as you do this thing called life. And thanks for worshiping with us. Oh God, peel back the layers of my heart. I want communion. I want fellowship. I want to be with you where Well, good evening. I want to welcome you tonight. It's kind of a special night. We have some of our young people being confirmed and I mean, taking their first communion this evening. So they're here in front, so their families are here. So welcome to all of you this evening. It's kind of a cool night in the life of Jesus and the church. On this night, Jesus said he showed his disciples the full extent of his love. He washed their feet. He taught them. Explained that they're supposed to love each other the way he loved them. And they opened this Passover meal and celebrated the history of their heritage as the people of God and how he rescued them from slavery in Egypt and said, this story is really about me. Let me explain that. Pastor Dan's going to talk about that this evening. And as we worship, we follow Jesus then to this night and join the disciples in this upper room and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me again tonight. Let me not only understand the story, but see where that story connects with me in my life. We go with the opening hymn. i 
we gather and worship, we speak God's name. It's called the invocation. We invoke the presence of God. We acknowledge this is the God we gather to worship. We say this is the God we're here to say we are one together in faith. As God said in baptism, I place my name upon you. I call you my people. You are mine. We're not just connected to God then, but we're connected to each other as a family of faith who gather here to worship again tonight. So we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this night, we gather in the upper room to witness a remarkable transformation. We see tired, dirty feet washed, clean, and refreshed. We see ordinary bread and wine be used by Christ for something profound. We see a close friend turn from disciple to betrayer. We see souls tainted with sin, forgiven by God. On this night, we too partake in the transforming power that Jesus gave us through his body and blood given for us. First reading tonight is from Luke chapter 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. And he replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of that house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover.
shows this foolish love that is completely over the top in creation. Let's listen to these words in John 13. This is how this Monday, Thursday ends. John 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you so much, love you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. <laughs> like how I did that? Yeah. So the new command is to love one another. A command that was set up by this evening that was filled with all kinds of teachable moments, all kinds of experiences that the disciples got to witness. In fact, here's how it begins in the book of John. John 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had had put all these things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, and he wrapped a towel around his waist. So it had already been quite a week, a significant week, because see, Monday, Thursday is actually the end of a week-long celebration, a week-long celebration of this great feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And throughout that week, historians would say that, that on this town, this, uh, the city of Jerusalem that had 25, 50,000 people in it, maybe as many as 2 million people came to celebrate this meal. They, they get that number because, well, Josephus, he writes in history about how there was 250 Passover lambs that were slain each year for the Passover. And, and a lamb would probably take care of 10 or so people. And so Jesus and his disciples, they were, they were gathered to celebrate this meal together. And it was a meal that tonight we're going to get to see. Jesus redefines. He reframes for us. But before he does that, he does something incredible to, well, some people would think is ridiculous or foolish. He, this rabbi, this teacher, the leader, he takes off his outer clothing, and he puts a towel around his waist, and he does something that would never make sense to the people who were there. Look at verse 5. After that, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. I have to be honest. Um, I'm not much of a foot guy. Anybody here like feet? I'd rather not see them. All right? Um, and maybe it's because I don't have very good-looking feet. In fact, I've actually had a doctor who said to me after looking at these wonderful feet, he said, you will never become a foot model. You might think that's rude. I thought, hey, maybe that's a compliment. Maybe, maybe I got a chance with the rest of me, right? And, and a, compared to my feet, I, I look like, you know, Captain America here, all right? But I will never wear... <laughs> Open-toed sandals. My, my wife has told me that. Um, in Jesus' day, foot washing was a thing. It was, because it was necessary. I lived on a gravel road for a while, and you can't keep a car clean on a gravel road. I had a gravel driveway for a while, and you can't keep your shoes clean, or the house, with a gravel driveway. And in Jesus' day, there wasn't, there wasn't concrete sidewalks or asphalt roads. There was just dirt. And so in that day, I'm not saying any of y'all would be all that clean in that day, but I'll tell you, if you were wearing sandals, and that's what people wore, open-toed sandals on dirt paths, your feet, <laughs> they definitely weren't clean. 
And, and so when you went to a, a feast and you gathered around a table, not a table that would be the ones that we have in our mind, you know, one where our feet are well underneath the table. No, this, this is a low table where our feet are in, in view. It was customary that, well, they would bring servants in to come and wash the dinner guest's feet. But Jesus, he flips all this upside down. He puts on a towel himself. And he pours the water himself. And he starts, this rabbi starts to wash their feet. I mean, why? What, how could that be? What would motivate him to do such a thing? Well, verse 6, it says this. He, he came to Simon Peter who, was, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but but later you'll understand. Peter said, no, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, and have no, you will have no part with me. Well, not just my, my feet, but my hands and my head as well, then, Jesus. You know, Peter is this guy who oftentimes he speaks and he acts in a, in a way that makes us laugh or get frustrated with him. And yet, to be really honest, if we think about it, we can probably relate to him. Because he's trying to do the right thing or say the right thing, but he's constantly messing up the whole thing, which we oftentimes do too. And so he's like, no, no, Lord, you can't. Don't you dare stoop down so low as to wash my feet. But Jesus says, but this is what I've come to do. I haven't come to be served, but I've come to serve. I haven't been, come to be elevated as a king like you think, but I've come to take on a mission that you haven't even seen coming. And it'll make sense soon, but I've come to sacrifice everything for you. And for those of you who follow me, I call you to service and sacrifice, too. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Jesus asked, do you understand what I have done? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also shall wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very tr truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And so Jesus, he shares his love, this love that from the world's perspective seems crazy. Seems like a foolish love. Wash my followers, my servants' feet. And yet, do you remember how it ended? A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone, they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. I flip everything upside down, Jesus says. I've come to be your substitute, your sacrifice. And even though what I've come to do is to give you everything, I call you, I call you to love like me. And it leads us then to serve like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to see people's needs around us like Jesus, to make a difference in the world around us like Jesus so that we can point people to our Savior, Jesus. Listen to these words from Exodus 24, 6 through 8. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and laws, they responded with one voice. 
everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls. In the other half, he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So this past New Year's, um, I got to tell you, our family were kind of party poopers. Anybody here stay up till midnight on New Year's Eve? We didn't. Yeah, we were in Chicago, and uh, about half of us, we went to the Chicago Bears game on New Year's Eve and got back. And uh, the other half, they went to the Grinch on Broadway, downtown Chicago, and got back. And we, we were in, uh, in our hotel room, and then we, we had to, of course, get deep dish Chicago pizza, right? And, and after a long day of all that and a bunch of food, we were ready to watch the ball drop, and guess what happened? We just all fell asleep. Never been in Times Square on New York, in, in New York on New Year's Eve, but I, I can only imagine how amazing it would be, how electric it would be with all those people. And 2,000 years ago, the only other celebration that would be anything like that would have been what happened in Jerusalem for the Passover. I mean, just think about it. Two million people. All to celebrate a very special feast and festival. And, and by this time, God's people would have been celebrating this festival for probably about 1,500 years. So they've done it quite a bit. And, and so I don't know about you, but um, have you ever heard, like, Christians sometimes call people who just show up at church on Christmas and Easter, they call them priesters? Have you ever heard that? Yeah. So I would assume that, you know, Jews, they had all kinds of festivals, right? But, but this was a big one. And so I bet a bunch of Jews called uh, certain people, they were the Provov- Provovians or something like that, right? They were the only ones who came on Passover. See, there's nine three of them that you might go to Jerusalem, but this was the biggie. This was the one that everybody came for. And so Jesus and the disciples, they came also to come celebrate this meal, this this celebration, this Passover. And and yet they came despite the danger. In fact, uh, honestly, you might say they came because of the danger. Because Jesus, he knew exactly what he was doing. He, he was putting all the pieces together. He was putting it all together to carry out his plan. Now, the disciples, they may not have known at the time, but they were about to. So Jesus, he starts this meal. And I've never, I, I don't know if you've ever celebrated a Seder meal, but there's a, there's a, there's a certain specific flow and order to a Seder meal. And, and it's all to remind us of God's great mercy and his grace that he gave to the Jews as he spared them from, from the tenth plague of the angel of death when God rescued them and freed them from their slavery in Egypt. And, and the Jews, they were... They were to celebrate this meal every single year as, as they did that very first Passover. And they were to celebrate by, um, by, by sacrificing an unblemished lamb and putting the, the blood of the sacrifice on the doorposts and eating the meat in haste. And yet now Jesus redefines this meal. It's still pointing to a God of grace and mercy who rescues from death and frees from slavery, but in a whole nother level. Because now it's a God about a God who, who saves us from the wages of sin, which is death, and frees us from a slavery that we find ourselves in to sin. And all because, because of a Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. 
All because of Jesus coming to be that ultimate sacrifice once and for all slain for us. So if we jump to, to the Matthew account, Matthew 26 of this evening, Jesus starts to help us to, to make the connection of how he's redefined and re, well, reframed this meal. Verse 26, while we were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Some really big, powerful words, right? Take and eat. This is my, my body. Take and drink. This is my blood. And, and what he's doing is he's drawing a straight line to what's going to happen the very next day. That he will be the sacrifice that has made all people. He is a sacrifice, this, the lamb that is slain for all people in our place to free us from the slavery that we have in sin and this curse of death that we have because of sin. And yet, his blood, his sacrifice is this new covenant, this new agreement that we have now between us and God. And those of us who, are, who, who put our faith in Jesus and what he's done, we, we no longer have to live under this old covenant, this, uh, what is, where it's all relying on me to get in where we have to do all these sacrifices and we have to keep all these rules and all these laws and we got to make sure that we're right before God. Because if it's on us to do that, we'll never make it. Here at Holy Cross, we have a, a couple hundred people who are reading through the Bible in a year. And, and when I was spending some time writing this, we had just finished the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And I was struck by the ending of this, this, this section of the Bible. This, the ending of this, this uh, powerful five books is Moses saying to the people, stay faithful, stay faithful. And then at the very end, he's like, you're not always going to be faithful. You guys stink at holding your end of the bargain. And what we see is that it, if it's about the old covenant, if it's about you and me, Holding up our end of the bargain, we're doomed. We'll always end up short. We'll always be insecure and we'll wonder if we did enough or we accomplished enough or have we become enough. But now with Jesus, there's no more questioning. There's a new covenant. It's not about what you do or what I do, but it's about what Jesus did. And see, this is why tomorrow's called Good Friday, even though it seems horrible. It's because it changed everything. Jesus flips everything upside down. And that's why he changes this meal, this Passover meal tonight. Because see, it no longer points to what was done 1,500 years before when Jesus did this. No, it points to what Jesus will do on Good Friday as he's the ultimate sacrifice for you. Tonight, we're going to celebrate this meal. And a number of you guys, this is your first time to celebrate this meal. It's a God moment where God comes in our time and space. And what we receive here is more than just bread and wine. We take Jesus at his word that he's in this moment, in with and under this bread and wine, he gives us his body, his blood. Where he not only says, I love you, but he, he comes into our time and space and gives us a spiritual hug to say what I did on the cross, I've done for you. So this is a meal that reminds us of exactly what he did. Reminds us exactly how he loves us. It reminds us of our desperate need for him. It reminds us that because of Jesus, we know what it means to be forgiven and set free. 
We know the power of a cross as a Savior is hung there in our place. This is a meal for you, a meal that Jesus gives out of love. you to stand as we continue our time in worship. This is a responsive from Psalm 23. Uh, It's a familiar psalm, but it's one that looking at from a different perspective, especially on on evenings like this and services like this, um, is powerful. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack no thing. Jesus, good shepherd, in your passion, you became the sacrificial lamb. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jesus, you filled your last supper table with those who would betray you. At your table, you chose to serve us. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Give us now a cup of blessing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from Luke, chapter 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation.
please be seated. You know, from time to time, something good happens out of something bad. Don't really see it as it's coming, but um, sometimes in the midst of a tragedy or disappointment, <laughs> something good can actually come out of something bad. Like, I, I'm hoping this is the case. When I was writing this, um, I'm a big, huge Chicago Bears fan, and Justin Fields got traded and Justin and I, are, we're really close. Well, actually, my son bought me a Justin Field jersey, so I'm kind of upset about that. And um, I was there on New Year's Eve for his last game in Soldier Field, and I was shouting with everybody else, uh, we want Justin. But anyway, hoping someday I can get up here and say something good came out of something bad. I was thinking in history, um, I know COVID was really horrible kind of thing, and yet in my history, it was something that was actually kind of life-changing because, well, it was a little over four years ago that Dave and some individuals reached out to me that Holy Cross was looking for a lead pastor, and if I would be interested in entertaining a call, and I'm like, no, there's way too much stuff going on in my ministry right now, and there's no way I could entertain that. And then... You guys know what happened when COVID came, right? Everything stopped. So a few months later, Dave and some guys reached out. I'm like, well, let me pray about it. I think back almost three and a half years being here, I can't imagine being anywhere else. Sometimes something good comes out of something bad. If you've been with us on this journey for a while, you know that um, our theme verse is a pretty powerful verse. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where it says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but, but to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Something good can come out of something bad, something horrible. Because the idea of the cross being something good is just crazy. It, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. But sometimes something good comes out of something bad. So after a very full day of celebrating, the disciples, they had no idea what they were in for. It was getting late. They were, they were tired. They were exhausted. And here's what happened. Verse 36 in Matthew 26. When Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And so he took Peter and two of the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. And yet, not as I will, but as you will. You know, Jesus knew what all this meant. He knew what he was going to face. He, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to go through with it, right? But he knew that the only way to rescue you and to me, the only way to overcome what was broken between you and God, was the duty unthinkable. The only way to win was actually to lose, which seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? So he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men watch just with me for an hour, he asked? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Powerful statement, isn't it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I was thinking some of you tonight is a huge milestone in your faith walk, 
in your journey of faith where you get to celebrate this meal for the very first time, where my prayer is that the Lord's Supper is something that you would look forward to, something that would fill you, something that would help you as you walk passionately following Jesus the rest of your life. But the reality is that there are going to be times that you and I, we get distracted. There's going to be times when we get tired. There's going to be times when we look the other way or fall asleep because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and that's why the story is so important why the story isn't done that's why Jesus is has to do what seems crazy that's why tomorrow it's coming good Friday's coming well actually probably by this time it's already here. It's probably right around midnight, and it's probably in the middle of the night, in the early moments of the next day that all of this is happening, and and the disciples have no idea what they're about to get into. And they are, (laughs) Jesus is asking them to watch and pray while they're falling asleep because it's been a long day. It's been exhausting, and and Jesus is pleading with, with God, and And yet, it's only just begun. Little do they know that they're about to enter the longest day of their life. When everything gets flipped upside down. They're about to see God come in and work in mighty ways, even though they wonder if it's all done, it's all gone. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. Sometimes good comes out of even bad. The power of God is going to be shown as our Savior gets hung upon a cross. And so here's my ask. My ask is that you would realize tonight is just the beginning of the journey. Will you guys come on the journey with us? Will you join us tomorrow as we as we go actually to the lowest of the lows, but as it leads us to Easter morning where we can celebrate what God's foolish love really wins. I invite you to stand.
Holy Communion is called a meal of oneness. We have a common confession. We all believe in Jesus together and we share that sense of love and forgiveness as a family of faith. And we do that first by confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. Will you confess it with me? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now we want to approach the presence of God it's usually appropriate to start off by saying, God, I want to get rid of all the sin in my life and own it and confess it. So as I approach you, I ask you to forgive me. I can come with a, a clean heart. Tonight as we celebrate Holy Communion, Jesus says, I'm going to be truly present here in this bread and wine. So as we come forward, so I want you to understand this is me here with you. And as we enter the presence of Jesus, he says, well, yeah, first of all, take a moment. And if there are specific sins in your head, uh, doubts or fears in your heart, relationships that have been broken, things you've said or done that bring you a sense of guilt or shame. This is an opportunity to say, God, I want to own those things, confess them to you, and ask you, please, tonight, for Jesus' sake, forgive me. I invite you to take a moment of silence, give you an opportunity then for that time of confession.
Father, you know me completely. But I speak these things and own them and ask you for Jesus' sake again tonight, forgive me. And pour out your Holy Spirit into my life that I can make any necessary changes to my attitude, to my life, to the habits I'm building in my life. I ask again tonight for Jesus' sake, forgive me. Amen. One of my great privileges in life is to stand before you as your pastor. And as if Jesus himself were standing here, I have to speak these words to you, that as a called and ordained servant of the word of God, I announce the grace and love and forgiveness of God to you. And this then by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we said, tonight's a special opportunity for some of our young people. At the beginning of communion distribution tonight, they're going to have an opportunity to come forward with their families, and we'll have a moment with each one of them to have a prayer over them and commune them together as a family. And following that, we'll all then join in the normal manner of coming down the center aisle for communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, if you have not remained apart from your people, but in this sacrament, your Son comes to us with his body and blood for us to eat and to drink. And gathered in his name, we pray that your Holy Spirit will strengthen our faith so that we will remain faithful in death and receive the crown of everlasting life. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all glory now and forever. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now the peace, Lord, be with you. Amen. As we celebrate communion, first of all, uh, they'll be coming down the center aisle. If, if you've never been instructed about Holy Communion, this is new to you, or you have a different understanding of what this is all about, we still invite you to come forward. Simply cross your arms. We'll speak God's words of blessing and forgiveness to you. We invite children to also come forward for that blessing as well. You may be seated at this time. Thank you. 
against every weapon that's formed. The thieves and his plans will pass over. He sees the red on the door. I plead the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Now this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in this true faith to life everlasting. We go tonight in his peace for our sins are forgiven. We go to take this love and forgiveness with us as we share it with each other and the world around us with peace. service this evening with the stripping of the altar. As we remove these elements, we prepare our hearts and our minds for a good Friday service and remember the sacrifice of Jesus. As we do this, we read Psalm 22, the psalm that was spoken by Jesus on the cross as he died for our sins. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? so far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. 
Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. 